ongoing in the country, especially in Almaty, still many unknown. So I think we need some modesty and humility in analyzing what is going on, but it's also very important to try to put together the different pieces of the puzzle that we have uh, uh, so far. And so for that, we have five uh, uh, great speakers who will be able to give them, give us their, their, their vision of what has been happening and some kind of clue about how to interpret that. We wanted to have speakers directly from Kazakhstan, but as you may know, internet is not working or working only in the morning, Kazakh time. So there was no way to get them uh, at this kind of late evening uh, time uh, currently. But our speakers will be able to share a lot uh, with us today. So we will have first uh, Mehrat Saribjanov, who is the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty Central Newsroom Senior Correspondent and former director of the Kazakh service. Then Timo Omarov, research consultant at Carnegie Moscow Center. Pauline Jones, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Digital Islamic Studies Curriculum at the University of Michigan. Barbara Janisby, Associate Professor at Pitzer College. And Nargis Kasenova, Senior Fellow and Director at the Program on Central Asia at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. I will give them the floor, each of them, for about 10 minutes. And during that time, I invite you to begin asking questions question in the chat box and then at the end so in about uh, 50 minutes we will have time for the Q&A we will go not for 60 minutes but for 90 minutes and so we should have about half an hour for uh, a discussion and I will be moder moderating uh, the Q&A session. Once again welcome and Mehrat the floor is yours. Thank you thank you and I'm greeting everyone from Prague Czech Republic um, Unfortunately, today's topic is not a very good one for myself personally, because it's about my country, Kazakhstan. Uh, what happened last week uh, shocked everyone, of course, uh, even people who were by uh, their profession uh, following the events and developments there. We got used to uh, regular protests in Genozan and uh, oil regions in Kazakhstan, which happened from time to time but we never expected that uh, this will lead to something that would happen. In the beginning, it looked like uh, the protests were uh, supported by other regions uh, close to the region, uh, close to Genozan and further on, but gradually uh, the, the protest was hijacked by unknown individuals uh, in a very controversial statements, uh, President Kasim Jamar Tokayev called them uh, terrorists, even international terrorists, giving the, the, the number, which is ridiculous for everyone, 20,000 international terrorists uh, operating under command of a single center attacked Almaty only. That's for, for anyone who is a uh, grown-up person, it's uh, incredible to believe. As a person who served in the Soviet army, uh, for myself, 20,000 troops is impossible to believe or whoever they are. Uh, for me personally, it looks like the some part of protesters, people who came from uh, the regions which are the poor regions, po impoverished regions, most likely some of the, of the protesters might started this kind of violence. But I also believe that there were some groups organized by uh, the uh, government uh, controlled uh, groups. And uh, as it usually was during the Soviet time, the KGB organized um, uh, provocations which uh, with a goal to discredit the protests were it, the taxes of that kind were used here as well. Um, we also, uh, can say that um, the uh, some kind of tug of war between uh, between uh, Tokayev and uh, other groups, I mean elite groups, close to Nazarbayev, most likely had taken place. Uh, the thing is that uh, we know that Masimov, Karim Masimov, the closest, one of the closest uh, allies of Nazarbayev was arrested. He was the, uh, the chairman of KNB, uh, Committee for National Security. 
And uh, today we just learned that one of his closest associates, Azamat Ibrahim, the colonel, was uh, found dead, most likely committed suicide. Um, uh, a regional police chief in Jambil region also committed suicide, according to the reports. And uh, the officials confirmed that he died, but they didn't say how and what circumstances. Uh, I think many things coincided here. The um, protests erupted, the protests were hijacked, and then uh, the standoff between uh, Tokayev and Nazarbayev's people somehow uh, took place as well. And the question is why? Uh, well, where is Nazarbayev himself? Is he in a very um, uh, grave condition? That's why the, the, his, his, uh, his uh, associates started uh, trying to remove Tokayev. We still didn't see him. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know where he is. We know that his press secretary, Aydos Utimbay, said that he is uh, okay. He never left Kazakhstan and he calls all Kazakhstanis to uh, support Tokayev. So, and this is very situation, of course, uh, Russia used this opportunity and uh, some deal was made and uh, the, uh, uh, the CSTO troops for the first time in the history of this organization were sent to Kazakhstan, which was uh, admitted very, in a very controversial way by many in Kazakhstan, of course. Many uh, compared with the uh, with, uh, intrusion of the Soviet troops, uh, Warsaw Pact troops to Czechoslovakia in 1968, some uh, compared with situation in Belarus uh, and many other. We cannot say for sure what really is happening there because the information is very, very, uh, we lack, we lack the, the complete uh, information because among all these reports, uh, the statements like 20,000 uh, troops or uh, terrorists coming to Almaty only, you know, they don't give us any uh, ground to believe anything the government says. And uh, also, uh, we don't know if, if when, when, when they say Masimov is arrested, we just remember how uh, in 2005, the former mayor of Almaty, Zamanbek Nurkadilov, was found dead with two slugs in his heart and, and then one slug in his head and it was pronounced as, as a suicide. So uh, to, to trust to whatever whatever the, the government says, it's very hard. Altindex Sarsimbayev who was killed in 2006 with his two uh, associates, the opposition figure. Also, uh, there were trials. Uh, one person was sentenced as an organizer and then it turned out he was, has nothing to do with, it, with this and then Rahat Alif, presidential son-in-law, pronounced as a suspect, and he was found dead in the Austrian jail. And all this, you know, that don't don't give any grounds to believe whatever the government is now saying. And of course, uh, in today's uh, during today's session of the CSTO member states uh, officials, when uh, when Vladimir Putin and uh, Tokayev again reiterated there was a uh, international terrorist group, international like uh, external forces attack to Kazakhstan were sounded sounded completely groundless for for for, for many who who knows Kazakhstan and who 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 uh, follows the the developments there. The most important thing, of course, is that everything is under control now, and uh, we'll see what's going to happen. And uh, if Tokayev is still in power. Uh, I think he will try to get rid of uh, Nazarbayev's people to the end. That's my thinking. And uh, uh, most hopefully, he will probably start some, some reforms he promised. Uh, that's the only thing I can tell for right now. Wonderful. That's Thank you so much, Merta, for kind of launching the, the, the discussion. As I said, the knowledge we have can only be very partial and, and fragmented. So I think it's giving us a good idea on how to begin the discussion. And I now would like to give the floor to Timur. Thank you very much.
um, and uh, thank you to Merhat for uh, this great introduction. Um, I also want to say that uh, we really have not much of uh, information right now to make any conclusions, uh, but uh, from uh, we already see, uh, considering all of the um, internet disconnections and uh, blockages in Kazakhstan, um, I see that uh, um, uh, the official um, official statements that are made right now, um, I, I don't think that they have uh, objective behind them. Uh, because uh, when we listen to Takayev and uh, all of the state media and uh, expert, some expert communities, um, uh, they all say right now that um, it was a planned, uh, organized uh, terrorist attack to, uh, with the with the goal uh, to make a coup to uh, take uh, take Takayev down. But uh, for me, uh, there are many um, you know holes in this theory. Uh, first of all. Uh, if we look at how coups are organized in other countries like uh, Kyrgyzstan, as we all know, uh, uh, this happens quite differently. Um, if it really was a coup, why everything happened in Almaty, not in Astana, not in Nur Sultan? Why uh, protesters chaotically destroyed uh, just infrastructure, roads, uh, cars, uh, supermarkets. Um, it, it doesn't look like, uh, you know, very organized group of people who have one uh, particular goal. Uh, for me, uh, it, it was really a protest that went too far um, and went very, very radical. Um, and the main reason for that is, um, that uh, why the government didn't expect it uh, is that uh, government just lost a uh, sense of uh, what uh, society um, thinks about the government, what uh, is the level of support um, in the society. And this uh, miscommunication led to this unexpected um, uh, situation. Um, and um, now we see that uh, President Takayev uses um, this uh, very uh, dangerous uh, situation uh, in his own uh, favor, um, as it looks from, uh, from uh, not inside, but outside of Kazakhstan. Um, uh, but again, uh, we shouldn't forget that um, apart from his consolidation of power, apart from uh, him right now becoming more influential player in, inside Kazakhstan, there are also uh, very big um, uh, risks for him. Uh, first of all, let's not forget that uh, Tokayev is um, uh, was put uh, to his uh, current position by President Nazarbayev, who is very unpopular, um, as it seems right now. So uh, um, it uh, it is not uh, true that. Uh, people uh, will forget that uh, Takayev uh, is associated with uh, Nazarbayev, uh, or if he gets uh, rid of Nazarbayev and his people from the government, uh, the people will be okay with that. Uh, people still think that he uh, is a part of the system, um, and uh, it's not just enough to uh, you know, get rid of uh, Nazarbayev as a head of um, uh, Security Council. Uh, there also should be uh, other steps uh, taken. And during the protests, we heard um, uh, people saying that uh, they need new elections uh, and new political reforms. And I think uh, this is what uh, people will be demanding um, in the future. Um, another uh, risk for Takayev's uh, position um, in Kazakhstan's political future um, is that right now he uh, relies uh, on Moscow much more than um, he used to and much more than Nazarbayev used to. Um, I mean, Kazakhstan for years has been known as this 
you know, very good example of uh, multivectoral foreign policy. Kazakhstan was always uh, a place where um, all Russia, China, and the Western uh, countries could find a middle ground, could uh, work together, and uh, it was not a uh, you know a country where um, uh, the balance between those three main uh, uh, geopolitical actors uh, was um, in a big conflict. Uh, Kazakhstan always. Um, uh, manage it to uh, balance between those. But now, uh, when uh, Takayev asked uh, CSTO, and obviously for everyone, CSTO is a Russian led organization, we cannot say that um, CSTO is a um, um, you know, an organization where all of the parties have uh, similar uh, power. Um, Takayev will. Uh, owe Moscow his uh, legitimacy, his uh, position. And this will, of course, uh, mean that Moscow will have um, much more influence on not, not only foreign policy of uh, Kazakhstan in the future, but also um, in um, domestic affairs. Um, and for Kazakhstan's future, um, I think it means that uh, we will, in the nearest future, see uh, some uh, very similar uh, political moves um, that we saw in Russia after protests, that we saw in Belarus after 2020. Uh, we will see a lot of uh, new uh, cases against um, activists that were uh, seen during the protest. I will not be surprised if we will see uh, uh, you know, any new laws against NGOs, uh, against uh, independent media, uh, this will, will not be uh, surprising for me. Um, I will stop here and we'll be happy to answer any questions. I, I see we have a lot of them. Thank you so much, uh, Timur, for your comments. And I'm now giving the floor uh, um, to Pauline. Sorry about that, I think I was still muted. Uh, thank you so much, Marlene. Thank you to the organizers and thank you, Tamar. You set this up perfectly for me because I really wanna shift focus uh, away from trying to understand uh, current events and, and how they unfolded to what this all means for the future of, of Kazakhstan. Um, and as Marlene said, we don't have, uh, and others have said, we don't have all the information. And so I am uh, being speculative a bit about what I think this means for the future. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's bright, I will say that. Um, but I think what we can do uh, or what we should do is think of this uh, moment, this historical moment, uh, as the end of a political transition that began in 2019. Uh, put differently, what I mean by that is 2019 was Nur Sultan Nazarbayev's first exit from power and 2022 seems to be his second exit from power. And the nature of the second exit, I think, has much broader implications for where Kazakhstan seems to be headed. So how does Nazarbayev's second exit differ from the first? I would say his first exit in 2019 was graceful, well-timed, and incomplete. It was graceful because rather than running for a sixth term in 2020, as everyone expected, Nazarbayev, who, as we know, was Kazakhstan's first post-Soviet president, he held the position for almost 30 years, resigned on March 19, 2019, and anointed then chairman of the Senate, Kasim Jamar Takayev, uh, his successor. Nazarbayev's first exit was also well-timed. If the goal, as I, and I think it was, was to preserve his own legacy. Uh, Nazarbayev built his reputation on the perceived success of his model of development, which was predicated on stability and prosperity via economic liberalization and soft authoritarianism. But these gains had really peaked by the mid uh, 2010s. And since roughly 2016, the economic situation in the country just continued to stagnate due to low oil prices, corruption and constraints on the growth of the private sector. Not unrelated, Kazakhstan also during that period experienced uh, increased popular discontent and political mobilization, forcing the government to utilize uh, some of its sovereign wealth, sovereign wealth fund to both support the economy and to increase social spending. Uh, clearly it wasn't enough, but there was some attempt. Um, finally, Nazarbayev's first exit was incomplete. He retained influence over the country in both formal and informal ways. Formerly, uh, he was named lifelong chairman of the National Security Council and leader of the ruling Nur Otan political party. 
Nazarbayev's second exit, I think, uh, couldn't be more different from his first. It is dishonorable, ill-timed, and complete. Uh, Nazarbayev was forced out, as we know, in the wake of these mass protests that have swept through Kazakhstan since January 2nd uh, of this year. Um, and although these protests uh, began in response to a steep rise in fuel prices and when one part of the country, they quickly spread uh, to many other parts of the country um, and they escalated from economic grievances to uh, concrete political demands. Foremost among these demands was for the regime to finally distance itself from Nazarbayev. Um, President Tokayev responded uh, not only by dismissing Nazarbayev from his formal position as chairman of the National Security Council, but also by attempting to remove Nazarbayev's political allies in the security apparatus and replacing them with his own. Although these actions uh, and others that he took did not quell protests, uh, they sent a strong signal that Nazarbayev is being held accountable for Tokayev's failure to implement needed and promised reforms. They have also thus, I think, changed the meaning of Nazarbayev's legacy, of his, his intended legacy. Uh, rather than being held up as the El Basi, the leader of the nation, and remembered for securing Kazakhstan's stability and prosperity, I think Nazarbayev will likely, more likely be equated with Kazakhstan's fragility. And more so, given Takaya's choice to repress protesters, uh, to engage in brutal repression, and to invite foreign intervention to prop up his regime, Nazarbayev's second exit will also likely be associated with the country's violent turn and loss of sovereignty, as I think Tamar uh, alluded to perfectly. So what are the broader implications? I clearly, I, I, I think I've, I've indicated uh, in a sense um, that they're not, they're not positive. <laughs> um, I think that Nazarbayev's second exit uh, signals three um, important uh, points of departure in terms of Kazakhstan's future trajectory. The first is an end to soft authoritarianism. Um, Takayev has clearly, I think, taken uh, the country in a more repressive direction. His decision to move swiftly to violent suppression of the protests and then order shoot to kill has opened the door to, use, to the use of state violence as a tool of regime stability. Um, this is not to say that the previous regime never used violent repression. Of course they did. And then there's a, an acute example um, in, the, in the very town um, where the January 22 protests started, Jerozen, um, in Western Kazakhstan. Um, that in, in 2011, police fired um, and killed protesters. Uh, so I'm, I'm not uh, suggesting that the, the re former regime was not capable of this. Um, but the regime, uh, the Nazarbayev regime, the previous regime, um, also regretted this use of force and tried to learn from it. Um, and so when there were larger demonstrations in 2014, after a currency devaluation, for example, and in 2016, in response to land privatization, the regime exercised restraint. So it wasn't a, a common tactic of the regime to use this kind of violent, brutal uh, repression against um, peaceful protesters. Takaya's repressive turn um, could also, I fear, bring an end to uh, elections and political competition. Even if elections were rigged and even if political competition was limited, it at least gave some semblance of contestation and representation um, in this uh, authoritarian regime, this soft authoritarian regime. Um, I think Takayev may be reluctant to hold elections, at least in the near future, um, for a few reasons. One, given the possibility of, of it serving as another focal point for popular mobilization and mass protests, we know that it, it commonly has across the former Soviet Union and outside of it. Um, and he clearly doesn't deal well with mass protests. Um, he may also be reluctant to hold elections because of what I think is a huge hit to his own popularity and legitimacy after the use of brutal force and after the call for outside military intervention, particularly of Russian troops. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, the question remains, however, I think this is a, is a crucial question that, that both of my colleagues uh, raised um, in their remarks, um, is whether Tokayev will continue to choose repression over reform. Will he engage in the political and economic reform that is needed and that he has promised? Um, will he take um, the protesters' demands seriously, uh, you know, calling them terrorists and, and, and um, sort of dismissing them as, as being um, uh, orchestrated by, by foreign interests? Um, you know, it's a tactic, but is it something that he's internalized to the extent that um, he's going to continue to choose repression rather than to engage um, these, at least the initial protests as, uh, uh, as legitimate um, uh, calls for uh, political and economic reform? 
And if he chooses reform, then he could possibly restore some of his popularity and legitimacy, which would make him more willing to hold elections in the future and allow some, uh, at least some semblance of political competition. So it remains to be seen. The second key point of departure, I think, is uh, again, something Timur mentioned, the end of a uh, multi-vector foreign policy. Um, as, as Timur said, um, Nazarbayev had, had played a really um, a, a expert uh, sort of balancing act among uh, different um, actors. Um, he remained friendly towards Russia, um, but he also maintained really good relations with the West um, so that he could court Western leaders as well as energy companies. Takaya's actions, I think, bring Kazakhstan further away from the West and closer not only to Russia, but also to China. Um, this is not just a move or a turn toward more oppressive, repressive authoritarianism and away from soft authoritarianism, but I think it's also clearly a turn toward authoritarian solidarity with Russia and China. Um, by taking Kazakhstan's authoritarian regime in the direction of greater repression, I think it's now uh, in lockstep with these two major authoritarian players uh, in the region um, who have always wanted more uh, influence in, in Kazakhstan. Um, Russia has a physical you know, boots on the ground. And of course, this has serious implications both for the short and the long term, even if the, even if the intervention is only short term. It has uh, implications for popular discontent, discontent uh, and thus for future popular mobilization. It also has, again, Timur mentioned this, um, it has implications for Takaya's loyalty to Putin and thus for future key decisions, key decisions that are about foreign policy and domestic policy. Takaya's harsh response to protests was also explicitly embraced by the president of China. So we know that there's some support there, not just his, um, his violent expression of the, the protests themselves, but his invitation uh, to uh, the Russian uh, intervention. Finally, I think the third key point of departure uh, is this is the end, it seems, of Kazakhstan's global image of stability, prosperity, and perhaps most importantly, sovereignty. Uh, this is an image that Nazarbayev very carefully, very expertly cultivated. And um, it was a, a, an image that was important both for international and domestic audiences because it helped secure the regime's legitimacy both at home and abroad. And so I think what this has meant internationally is a loss of credibility, at least in the West. It's also a strong signal to the West, as well as to other states in the post-Soviet region, that Russia will not hesitate to intervene in what it considers its sphere of influence. Domestically, I think the Russian troops can definitely cause a nationalist backlash. This is what I was referring to earlier about uh, popular mobilization in response to this, this decision to allow foreign intervention. Um, it also uh, domestically, um, this, this it can lead to a perceived loss of sovereignty, which is going to affect the regime's legitimacy, as I mentioned earlier, and thus possibly uh, the continuation of this repressive uh, authoritarian trajectory that Dakayev seems to have taken the country in. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll end there and wait for questions. Thank you so much, Pauline, for these great comments. Let's now give the floor to, to Barbara. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, wonderful. Um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And I did want to uh, acknowledge and give my recognition to those of you who are from Kazakhstan and have family and friends there. I know this is a really difficult time. Um, so my ex-husband and my youngest are in Almaty and uh, I hadn't spoken to them for a week and it was terrifying. So my heart goes out to all of you who have family and friends there. Um, I would like to, um, many of my comments are, will be repetitious, I think, of what others have already said. Um, but I'd like to think about this, I, acknowledging that we have very limited information, we come with our earlier frameworks, you know, how we see Kazakhstan based on our research and our understanding of the country um, and our disciplines. Uh, I would like to divide up how I, I'll, I'll share how I think about it in terms of different levels of analysis. So first I would like to acknowledge the protesters. Um, and, and my comments are also based on some conversations I had yesterday in the more early morning and in the evening with folks who are in Almaty. And I'm gonna focus mostly on what happened in that city. Um, so let me show some photographs really quickly, oops. Ah, sorry, technical issues. Okay, um, so I'm gonna share my screen. And these are some photographs from 
early Thursday morning in the city of Almaty. Um, so these were sent to me uh, by a friend who is in the city right now. And their comments were um, that Wednesday night, there was massive looting in the city and that it looked like the violence had overtaken the protesters and that possibly the protesters were a different group than those who were violently engaged in destruction. Um, it also looked to my friend that there was no military and no police around Wednesday evening, which I would like to return to in my narrative. So this is early, one, early Thursday morning after the destruction, protesters, peaceful protesters are gathering on the square in Almaty, making plov for their community. We are a simple people. We are not terrorists. Tokayev soldiers leave. We are a peaceful people. And then again, Tokayev soldiers leave. We are peaceful people. Um, we are simple people. We are not terrorists. And that's that. So I wanted to start with that. So I think there are many things happening here. The first is that yes, people are hurting. And I would agree completely with the things that have been said earlier, I think particular by uh, Pauline and Mirhat that Kazakhstan used to be a place where the middle class expected to grow and expand and people expected that their life would get better. And I think this is really important for people who live in the cities, but it's also really important to note for Kazakh speaking Kazakhs who come from the villages who move to the cities to find a better life. There is a narrative in Kazakhstan that Kazakhstan is the place for Kazakhs. And yet we know that Kazakhs are the ones who are economically disadvantaged and suffering and rural Kazakhs are doing terribly in Kazakhstan. I think it's also really interesting that Tokayev made a lot of his comments and speeches in Russian. So I've lived in Kazakhstan off and on for various times and that kind of anger that I felt among Kazakhs who've moved to Astana or Almaty was there for a long, long time. So I, and then there's, you know, people who like in the, you know, up to the mid 2000s, they expected that their lives would get better. People would all have cars. That's why gas is so important because everybody has a car. People thought that their children would live better and they haven't, right? There's been a decline, global decline, right? In the United States, we're not immune to this either. Um, so I think that there is a real protest element and that it's, you know, I am sympathetic to it. I, I feel that it is correct. And I, my, my sympathy goes to the protesters and those photographs touched me to no end when I saw them. I think there's also, it's also true in Kazakhstan, and this is what a lot of my research has been on, is that there's infighting in that regime. We can't think about it as a consolidated monolithic system. And I think Pauline said it so beautifully in regards to foreign policy and Mirhat said so beautifully in regards to the regime. I think both of you used the term balancing act. Nazarbayev was not only excellent at balancing foreign policy, he was excellent at balancing all of these different elite groupings. He did not always succeed. We know this from different kinds of elites who've gone into the opposition. But for me, the most important element here is, and I'm speculating, I don't have evidence. I'm going to say what I think based on what I've studied. I feel that a lot of this has to do with the Nazarbayev family. So, so interesting that in a BBC interview that uh, former Prime Minister Akijan Kajagelden gave just yesterday, I think in the morning, um, he said, and the journalist pushed him, but he said, Almaty is the city of Nazarbayev's family. Nothing happens there without their permission. And I thought about it and I um, have studied how Nazarbayev's family has caused a lot of infighting within the elite and has been a, so, a weak spot for President Nazarbayev. So I asked my, one of my friends who's in Almaty about this possibility. And they said, I walked in the streets on Wednesday night 
and there was rioting and looting and it was chaos and I saw no police and I saw no military. Then on Thursday morning, all the rioters were gone. The peaceful protesters were back and there was still nobody. There was no military, there was no one. That person also said that the buildings were not protected and that the airport was not protected. And that is why the destruction was allowed to happen. And it brought me back to the conversation to the interview with Akishan Gelsen, and I was, I was thinking there could be a connection there and I don't have evidence for it to be so, but it is very strange that at the time when the writing happened, there was no protection and that that protection came later. And that Kazakhstan is, is in some ways could be considered like a weak state, but in other ways it's not. I have been to protests earlier in earlier times in Kazakhstan and the police presence and the military presence and the, what is it called? The Oman presence was tangible even in the most peaceful protests. So it is very strange to me that in this case of chaos and violence that they would not also be there. Um, so I think there's a lot of things happening here. Uh, it could be that the protests occurred and they were widespread across the country and um, perhaps people, not Nazarbayev himself, but people close to him, including perhaps his family members, like they may have used that as an opportunity to, to um, stake their claim more forcefully and more powerfully to try to undermine President Bukayev and it could have backfired. Now, these are all just my speculations and I don't, I mean, there must be alternatives, but I would like to definitely give my respect and my honor to those brave people who went out and who used their voice because that, I think even in, when I think about even in democratic countries, it's not always easy to do that, right? But I think some other things are happening too. And I think it will become clearer what those fissures are in the government. Um, and the fact that Masimov, you know, um, was arrested and the other cases that folks had given examples of also, I think, supports this idea that there are multiple levels of things happening and that the state is trying to use it to its, Tokayev is trying to use it to his advantage. Um, and then my last comment is about terrorism. I think terrorism is a really interesting, it's a very convenient blanket because you can say people on the streets are terrorists and inside the government, there have been infiltrations of terrorists. And then you can take care of both problems at the same time uh, under one umbrella. And then you can invite Russia, right? Because they're also afraid of terrorists. And then you can get sympathy from abroad because everybody is, when it comes to the word terrorism, everyone wants, is fighting against it. Um, so those are my initial thoughts. Um, and uh, I appreciate your, your time, thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, for your great comments. And let's now give the floor to Nargis. Thank you very much, Marlene. And uh, today, today is the day of mourning in Kazakhstan. And uh, my heart also goes to all my compatriots so, and, um, and everybody, um, everybody there. Um, so let me build. Uh, let me build on what uh, my colleagues uh, have been saying. Uh, the, indeed, there are so many questions um, that need to be answered. Uh, but let's start with what we, uh, what we know as, as of now. Um, until last week, uh, President Takayev uh, didn't have full power and actually didn't have much power. Uh, he was uh, surrounded by, uh, by Nazarbayev clan um, clan people. Uh, so that's something that we need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, he was, of course, he was appointed by Nazarbayev and he was part of this political, political transition process. And uh, we don't know what role he was assigned in this transition process and whether kind of there was a further, you know, further plan. Uh, we also know that was that there was inter-elite, uh, inter sorry, uh, struggle going on, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, possibly it uh, uh, got intensified with the uh, alleged worsening of uh, uh, Nursultan Nazarbayev's health. 
uh, and uh, we, of course, we don't know what plans these these groups and how many groups uh, have been uh, have been entertaining. And uh, um, yeah. uh, we uh, we know, as as Barbara mentioned, that uh, some members of the uh, political elites in the country, uh, and especially um, members of his family, had pretty shady, shady networks. Yeah, Barbara said that that uh, uh, well, Bulat, uh, for example, Bulat Nazarbayev, you know, he controlled the, the bazaars in the Almaty, uh, Almaty Oblast, uh, and uh, uh, Samat Abish, he uh, he was heading various sports associations, and we know what sports associations are in the post-Soviet space, and the the kind of the, the banditry and the, the racket that is associated with it. Uh, we know that uh, Kairat Satibaldi, kind of, he, uh, uh, he sort of patron he has been patronizing uh, various Islamist networks, and you know, at a certain point, he even tried to create the um, the Akorda Islamist movement. Uh, so we kind of we, we knew all this yeah. um, prior to uh, prior to these uh, prior to these events. Now, last week, it's hard for me to believe that all these events, the chain of events started only seven days ago. So much, so much has happened. Uh, but uh, indeed, the it's the kind of, the, it all started with protests that spread like fire from, from Western Kazakhstan across the country. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and the, the kind of, uh, the causes where all these grievances that have been uh, have been accumulating, uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, grievances, also uh, the kind of uh, disappointment with the uh, with the government and with the mismanagement and corruption and and all of that. So it's not surprising that uh, that this protest spread, uh, given the worsening economic situation, given the pandemic. Uh, we uh, we know that something some very strange things happened on the fourth and uh, fifth of January, yeah? and that's something that will require major uh, major investigation. Uh, we know that there were mixed crowds in the streets of Almaty. There were kind of the, the protests that we usually see with uh, with political demands. Uh, we saw some um, some people from the outskirts of Almaty. Uh, the, we um, we hadn't seen these faces uh, before. Um, we definitely um, saw some criminal criminal elements, uh, really bandits, thugs, um, in big numbers in the city as well. And uh, where they came from, where they met, where they mobilized by some forces, you know, that that's a that's a big question. But it seems to me that. Uh, uh, it was orchestrated to 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 some extent. The, the the kind of this mobilization was orchestrated. Like so many things were going on. There was the kind of there was a protest. There was a genuine mobilization by kind of people who wanted some change, who were really uh, uh, sick and tired of what's happening what's happening in the country. Uh, but there was something more kind of much more sinister going on um, uh, going on. Uh, as well, and at the uh, what Barbara mentioned, the big question is why the security forces left left the city unprotected. Uh, uh, my own mom, uh, she she saw the uh, the military trucks leaving, kind of going away from the center uh, around seven eight in the morning on the fifth of January, and that's when there was this you know big disorder in the streets already. So. So the city clearly was left completely unprotected. Um, what was happening in Akorda at this moment? Yeah, that's when uh, when uh, President Takayev reaches out to uh, President Putin and President Lukashenko and you know asks for uh, asks for help. Um, so and I, I think it sort of does make sense to me that you know if he didn't have much control with security uh, security forces. Then you know, uh, inviting CEOs still might have been the only 
uh, the only choice he had uh, he had at the time, no matter how tragic this decision is and how much it affect, uh, kind of affects the damages the reputation of uh, uh, of the country as a sovereign um, sovereign state. Um, on the sixth, the the security the, the security the military um, came back. That that's after you know the the CSTO um, kind of decision. Uh, well, the decision was ma made by the CSTO to send uh, to send peacekeepers right to deal with the external terrorist uh, external terrorist act. And here, uh, my take on it is that uh, the kind of invoking. Uh, invoking kind of this terrorist external terrorist threat was the uh the only kind of legitimate way to get the CSTO troops quickly uh into the country um uh, we see that, that they are not really uh participating in uh any uh in military operations on the ground so i think that their role was primarily symbolic that that's that's my take on, on it we'll see uh, i think that will leave uh, fairly uh fairly soon. Uh, and uh, the kind of uh, the, the arrival signal to you know, political elites that uh, uh, President Takayev has the support of, uh, of Russia, of uh, President Putin. Um, uh, and it was, of course, a signal to the outside world, you know, that, that you know, <laughs> Russia uh, is in charge, it is uh, Russia's sphere of influence. And when you know when there is a crisis, it's Russia will take care of it. Um, so the uh, okay, a little bit uh, digressing, but uh, um, I, I I think they kind of they had to do it. They had to say that it was an external <laughs> external uh, terrorist attack for political expediency. Uh, but not with regard to protesters, but more kind of to get the, the uh, to get the excuse, uh, the kind of legitimate reasons to bring to bring um, Russian support. Um, so, and already we see the changing kind of changing narrative. Um, uh, well, the new state secretary Irlan Karin, for example, he gave an interview. Um, I guess today, uh, today in Kazakhstan to to blast KZ, and he said that it was a conspiracy of domestic actors with some with the participation of some external destructive forces. Um, so already we see this kind of shift of the emphasis on uh, on domestic actors, and we do see that. Uh, Top people, some top people are being detained, and uh, and so on and so forth. And we see some suicides already, you know, of uh, of Kanbe people, and so on and so forth. So, um, what next? Uh, as I already mentioned, I think CSTO forces will leave. Uh, I don't think they will stay because it would be a huge you know, problem for uh, for uh, the um, for Takayev and uh, his government. Um, uh, I think it served its purpose already, so uh, it's definitely uh, it was kind of uh, uh, a win for for President Putin. Um, but I, I don't think they will stay. It's definitely kind of uh, not an invasion or anything like that. Um, I I think there will be uh, a we will see reforms, at least an attempt to carry out uh, reforms, particularly socioeconomic reforms, because I think there is a uh, there is a there is understanding at all levels that the country is in a very bad shape, uh, and uh, it's uh, now the situation is explosive. Uh, so uh, President Takayev keeps keeps talking about these reforms. We'll see what package he will uh, put together. Uh, and if the most kind of the most predatory elite members are removed from the system, maybe there is a chance. And if the good people are put uh, uh, put in charge of the reforms, then maybe we do have a chance. And maybe then the uh, kind of all the loss, the losses, and the trauma of last week will not be in, in vain. Um, uh, as for political reforms, he promises political reforms. Um, 
I don't know how much uh, kind of how much we can deliver in this department, but I think there is kind of an intention is there, but of course we shouldn't forget that it's not a complete overhaul of the system. We're not dealing with the revolution. Uh, it's these are the, the kind of the same people, but you know, kind of different group in the same system who who will be trying to uh, to do these things. And definitely, there are kind of uh, it's hard to change ways overnight. Yeah, and that's why we hear some strange rhetoric and some you know uh, and. Uh, the, the, the propaganda in this embarrassing, highly embarrassing case with the Kyrgyz musician who was kind of shown on TV as if he is this kind of hired, uh, um, you know, hired foreigner to destabilize, you know, kind of uh, used to destabilize Kazakhstan. So uh, the, the, there will be an attempt to, to introduce new ways, but of course the old ways, they still hold strong. Um, on uh, on the system, and for me, the kind of the most worrying kind of what what really worries me uh, today is to think how the kind of development of the political system proceed from now on. Uh, whether the you know political elites will be able to find some kind of equilibrium that is you know good for the country for the stability of the country uh, or not. The latest event showed that uh, the um, well, the later the, the kind of the past decade shows that uh, um, our, our elites are not in the best shape. Our political elites definitely uh, um, we're not thinking of the public interest of the national interest. So I do hope that people kind of more public interest minded, more national interest minded, uh, will kind of you know. <laughs> will come, uh, will come up, and uh, uh, and we'll see. So the the there is a lot of worry, but also some hope that uh, that I think we we have now. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nargis, for also these great comments. I mean, all of you were really great in bringing together very different pieces and trying to be very reasonable and cautious about what we know, what we think we know, what we are just speculating, what we are interpreting. So I wanted to really uh, 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 thank you all for, for, for this uh, great presentation. We now have time for a question. And as you may have seen, there are like just ton of them <laughs> in, the, in the chat box. So I will try to kind of uh, summarize the key ones and try to put them together in kind of a thematical uh, package. Maybe we can begin with the, the foreign policy aspect and then move back to the, the domestic aspect. You already, all of you mentioned several of these elements and now these uh, uh, especially uh, a lot of questions coming in the chat about Russia's motivation. So far, the CSTO never accepted a request. It's the first time that the CSTO is indeed replying positively to a request. So why in that case, uh, 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 Moscow felt that he had to intervene. Some people are asking what that uh, kind of conspiracy, like Russia knew if something would happen and was participating, or how can we uh, uh, discuss the, the, the perception also from the Russian side? And of course, question about Russia's positioning in the Earth, China, sorry, positioning and uh, much more cautious, of course, and, and how we can interpret that Pauline was mentioning that Kazakhstan is kind of moving even more than before to the Russia-China fall. But if we could have some of uh, the speaker's comments on both Russia's motivation to intervene and then China's position would be great. And then maybe after we can move uh, back to the domestic field. Which of you would like to, to take this to question on Russia and China? Me? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go please. Ahead. So, sorry, uh, I think I interrupted Mirhat. Um, okay, I'm gonna take a Russia and China question. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Russia's and China's relations uh, in Central Asia and uh, the uh, so-called competition between Russia and China in Central Asia was a little bit um, over exaggerated um, in in the informational sphere. Um, and I think that uh, what happened um, in Kazakhstan and what happened earlier in Tajikistan 
with regard to Afghanistan shows us that uh, Russia and China cooperate more in Central Asia than, uh, than uh, compete, actually. Uh, for China, uh, number one priority in Central Asia is stability. And right now, China doesn't care whether the stability will be reached in Kazakhstan with Kazakh's own uh, internal forces or Russia, which is a very good uh, China's partner, will come and make the situation stable. Uh, China doesn't need to have um, a very, you know, hectic, unprecedented, unpredictable uh, uh, country on its border with uh, Xinjiang, uh, Uyghur uh, Autonomous Region, which is a very, you know, um, very sensitive uh, um, region for, for from the point of view of Beijing. Um, so um, I think that. Uh, China is totally okay with um, uh, Russia's uh, position um, in Central Asia, and it will not take any uh, real actions uh, towards it. I quite agree with that. And I just wanted to add that in this situation, uh, if you noticed uh, Kyrgyzstan, which sent just a small number of, uh, of troops there, uh, in the beginning was hesitating to do it. There were some uh, parliament members, uh, you know, not willingly coming to this session and stuff. But Putin made them send troops there anyway. It seems to me that for Putin, it's very important that CSTO is one and even symbolic, symbolic participation is important. And it might be uh, a very good tactic, so very good idea for Putin today, especially when we're talking about the uh, escalation of tension uh, along the Ukrainian border. If Russia, which is now being discussed, uh, even today there was a discussion between Biden and Putin about, about Ukraine. If Russia starts uh, military operations against Ukraine, it will be not Russia, but several countries fighting against, against Ukraine. That might be uh, easily an issue because Russia help Tokayev, and now Tokayev, as a member of the CSTU, has to help Russia. Uh, other CSTU member states took part in this operation in Kazakhstan. Now they're supposed to take part in any other operations Russia is leading. So that's very important here. And as for Chinese, uh, as for Chinese uh, thing, I just want to remind you that Kazakhs have a very interesting, uh, very useful uh, saying, saying that all spend all that for son, uh, if you have a Russian friend, have your uh, military acts ready. But they also have another proverb saying, If mass of Chinese come, Red Russian will be like your father. So, and Chinese know about it. They will never send troops there because Chinese uh, are an ethnic group. Unfortunately, I'm not a racist or something, but there is a huge kind of rejection of Chinese in Central Asia in general, especially in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. People don't like Chinese. There were so many protests against Chinese and stuff historically. And Chinese, they know it. They don't need to enter there. They, they need stability and agree with that. And they, uh, uh, they want to make money in a very stable country. How the stability is there, they don't care. Can I add something, Marlene, or was there another? Thank you, Mich yeah, yeah, of course, of course, Pauline, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, I, I just to the question of why Russia was so quick to, to support the intervention, um, albeit through the CSTO, um, and, and some might want to compare it to, to Kyrgyzstan and um, why you know Russia wasn't uh, willing to intervene um, last October. Um, I think that uh, the stakes are just much higher. I, I think it's kind of clear um, they're higher in, in terms of you know the instability in Kazakhstan because it is such a big important economy because of its oil wealth, um, because of its border, its very long border with Russia and with China, uh, as my colleagues mentioned, and and then just demographically the fact that there are you know, a sizable Russian population. So I think the stakes are just much higher. Um, that made the, the decision much easier. Thanks, nice. Pauline. Nice. Barbara, nice. would you like to add something on that? 
Nara gets to go. Go ahead, yes. Nara. Yes, uh, I think the, the cost benefit analysis was different in case of Kazakhstan, right? Compared to Kyrgyzstan and Armenia, um, because the costs, you know, um, the costs were not that high actually, right? Well, sending 2000, you know, troops, it's not a, such a big deal, especially if uh, you don't think they will be in harm's way, you know? so. Uh, I think kind of the, there was understanding that uh, uh, Kaz Kazakh uh, forces can manage the situation, right? Uh, and indeed, that's what we see. They are kind of not engaged uh, in military activities. These are Kazakh forces um, that are managing the situation. Yeah. Uh, and that would have been very different if uh, Russian soldiers were sent to, to deal with the interethnic conflict in southern, uh, southern Kyrgyzstan, right? Um, or if they were sent on the uh, Armenian-Azerbaijani border. But the benefits were very big. So I think they kind of, they, they made an assessment. Uh, and I think they were convinced by President Takayev that the situation is very serious, right? So, um, uh, so yeah, that's, that, that's how it happened quickly. And it's interesting to, <laughs> to read the, uh, Lukashenko's, <laughs> President Lukashenko, Lukashenko's account of, uh, of, this, um, of these talks. As usual, he's the most you know, outspoken. Love Thank boys. you all. Let, yeah, please. Um, yeah, let's now move. There is another series of questions, maybe this time also on the kind of the, the, the Russian intervention, but seen from, from the outside, from the inside, sorry, of Kazakhstan. One question about, so the, how can we speculate on the motivation for Tokayev to call Russia for help? Nargis mentioned maybe the, the, the impression that he wouldn't be able to uh, control what was happening with the, the, the intra-elites or as a way to showcase that he had the support of Russia and not the other part of the elite. So it would be interesting to get the feedback of other speakers if they have. And also a question we have about the population reaction toward that presence of, of Russia and what it means symbolically in terms of uh, symbolic sovereignty, especially no, toward the, the Kazakh speaking part of the population. So how do you think the regime will be then able to balance this kind of symbolic uh, uh, loss of, of uh, sovereignty, especially toward the, the Kazakh speaking part of the population? And then we will move back to move more to regimes and protest uh, gradually with the next round of questions. Who would like to take this kind of uh, two questions? I can start if um, no one else wants. Um, yeah, please. I, I, I... I think that um, the um, I, I, I've uh, talked to uh, some of my uh, friends from Kazakhstan, and uh, according to what I see in social media, um, I don't think there are many uh, Kazakh uh, people who are uh, Kazakhstani people who are happy with uh, Russia, uh, Russian forces um, in Kazakhstan, um, and uh, the success of this campaign here uh, from the Russian point of view depends on whether Takayev and his all uh, informational campaign right now uh, will succeed in um, making sure that people believe that this was international terrorist attack. Um, if uh, he manages to reach this um, you know, um, theory to be believed um, by the majority of uh, people in Kazakhstan, I think people uh, will understand that uh, this was something that Takayev had to do. He had to uh, call to Moscow for help because it was a very, very serious case and uh, Kazakhstan's own forces didn't have enough capacity to fight um, international terrorism. Uh, so um, I, I think this is the only way um, um, Russia uh, can, um, you know, gain uh, some kind of uh, support from uh, the people um, in Kazakhstan. Maybe I can add. Thanks, Timur. Yes, please. Yeah, well, the, the reaction was negative. The initial reaction was negative, right? Uh, we, we saw it on social social media because because exactly symbolically you know 
it's it's bad, right? Uh, uh, the we have protests and you know kind of some disorder and uh, uh, and uh, and then you know the the, the leadership invites uh, invites Russians, right? Um, and and indeed, you know, kind of only last month we celebrated, uh, you know, thirty years of independence with uh, <laughs> with a lot of pomp, right? Uh, and we kind of thought of ourselves as this kind of, you know, uh, not great power, but sort of medium power, right? Uh, and well to do and overachiever and, and uh, in the region and, and so on and so forth. And suddenly, you know, kind of. Uh, you have a crisis, and immediately you invite the Russians. Um, but but overall, uh, kind of de facto, of course, they they they, they had been you know dependence, security dependence on Russia, right? Um, so so I think it's kind of, uh, uh, but it wasn't. That obvious, right? Uh, the, the prior to prior to this crisis, uh, to, uh, to to people. Now we kind of know more about it, but uh, but but overall, I, I have a feeling now it's already kind of the the the, the Kiev's, uh, um, image is improved, right? It's improving like by by the day with uh, kind of the restoration of order, and then you know if next week if the package of Kind of if he appoints the the, the re relatively decent the decent people into the government that he announces like some meaningful reforms and actually if they, they start getting implemented I think he can gain a lot of legitimacy so, um, the expectations say growing um, by by the hour uh, in the country so so yes it, it was a blow to the reputation it was a blow kind of to our the, the self image uh, uh, but you know, since since actually the, the, the Russian troops were not participating in suppression of uh, protests and, you know, kind of they, they stay aside and guard the infrastructure, whatever, you know, kind of now it's mitigated. Uh, and, and we'll see. Thank you, Dewey. Mehat, would you like to speak on that? Yeah, in the beginning, of course, it was especially uh, among the lack of uh, sufficient information. It was like uh, similar to many people. It considered as similar what happened in Belarus when, uh, well, the troops were probably not sent, but Putin obviously supported Belarusian dictator Lukashenko and stuff like that. And uh, it was a very uh, uh, hard for Kazakhstanis to, or for Kazakhs, especially Kazakh speakers, to accept that. Uh, everything will depend upon what's going to happen in future. And uh, for, unfortunately for Tokayev, even if, if, if the reforms are done and the elections are made, uh, are held in future, he might lose because of this. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, a big damage in his reputation. It's better now, probably, but still, uh, many Kazakh Kazakhs already. I uh, I heard several places where people were just uh, in a very strong traditional Kazakh way, uh, saying that uh, uh, his uh, ancestors and his uh, Tokayev's uh, sons and grandchildren must be condemned forever by Kazakh. So this is this is very serious. For people who suffered all this hullabaloo and uh, chaos in Almaty, of course, what's happening now, it's it's good sign and everything is okay, but people in Janozen, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that they will ever forget this. And I'm not sure that they will uh, forgive, let's say, that Tokayev, for them, it is Tokayev invited Russians to, to deal with, uh, with the protest. They don't care if they are uh, Russian troops or Armenian, Tajik troops, many Russian troops, Belarusian troops. They uh, just got it, the objects. If they're guarding the objects, the question is why you were inviting them? If they're not doing anything, just, 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 just guarding the objects, why are you inviting them? And then Russian uh, television showed uh, huge number of uh, vehicles, military uh, personnel moving. 
from Orenburg area to entering Kazakhstan and stuff. So this is a, this is this will be very hard to 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 forget, and that might damage uh, uh, Tokayev's uh, reputation for a long time, if not if not forever, especially among Kazakh-speaking regions, it's west, southwest, southern part of Kazakhstan. Thank you so much, uh, Mehrat, and, and all of you. Uh, we have also a lot of questions that are more about kind of intra-elite politics. And here, I guess, we only have to speculate about what we can imagine is happening. So we have question about, does that mean that Nazarbayev is now politically dead, that his family is politically dead? And what does that mean for the part of the family that is very uh, economically in charge of uh, many things like Kulibayev? Uh, uh, what do we know about the possible kind of Islamist connection or whatever may have been uh, uh, related to kind of grooming Islamists at home. So that's the kind of, uh, a lot of questions are kind of going around these two issues. What is happening with the Nazarbayev family, the Nazarbayev clan? Do we have any clan issues here also at stake or should we use other terminology to discuss what is happening and whatever for this kind of Islamist aspect that is emphasized by the propaganda, but seems very modest on the ground, but still maybe it's not totally absent. So if you could also comment on these different aspects, and then we will have a last round of question on the protester themselves. Who would like to begin on the Nazarbayev family, the, the kind of intra elite fight and the Islamist aspect? Well, I think it's, um, it's a big exaggeration that uh, <laughs> Nazarbayev's family, in fact, uh, uh, members of his family tried to, you know, uh, cherish or grew up uh, some Islamist cells or Islamist or fundamental Islamist groups in Kazakhstan. I, I don't, I don't think it's a very serious allegation. The thing is that Karatsa uh, Baldi, uh, yes, he is. Uh, He's religious, he wants to show, you know, that he's religious. But for me, it always looked like he was wanted just to show the how religious he is. And you know, he was. I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, he was he had some groups, he had some um, uh, he financed some groups who propagated uh, Islam, uh, which was like um, a sign of coming back to the roots after the Soviet past, uh, you know. I, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, yes, the uh, Nazarbayev's family controlled everything in, in the country, especially Almaty um, and the southern part of the country, but not only. Uh, uh, Nazarbayev's family was controlling all aspects of life in, in Kazakhstan, for sure, he, directly or indirectly, that's that's 100%, but I'm not sure that they, they anything uh, about Islam, yeah, Nazarbayev went to, to Hajj, to Mecca. Yes, he went there, uh, you know, uh, he, his family members went there too, you know, but Nazarbayev also, his family members also met uh, uh, the Pope, uh, Jan Paul, uh, John Paul II, you know, uh, very huge, big uh, event, the, the John Paul II came to Kazakhstan. I don't remember exact year, but uh, the family members met with him. Uh, no problem. There is nothing about fundamentalism. We have to remember that this family is from the Soviet Soviet past. I mean, they cannot they cannot be behind any really Islamic fundamentalists or Islamic kind of groups or supporting Islamists or something. I I, I don't think this is an issue here. Can I add? Thank you, Mehrat and Nargis. Yeah, well, yes. it's qu quite, quite a family, right? Uh, I think there is a good amount of diversity. <laughs> uh, what they have in common, I think, is the unbounded greed. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. It seems no much, no, no, no matter how much money they had, you know, not much. My, how much power sorry i didn't sleep much <laughs> over, the, <laughs> over the week uh they had the, the, it wasn't enough you know and uh 
definitely they all had the uh, big political ambitions as well. Um, and I, not all of them were religious, obviously, but, uh, but uh, well, uh, Kairat Satebaldi definitely was seen as a major patron of uh, Islamists in, in Kazakhstan. And I think he did, in, he did have uh, political ambitions, uh, you know, using um, these kind of networks, this kind of base, you know. Uh, I already mentioned the Akorda movement that he launched, and it was a big thing at the time. Um, I think it was 2008, but uh, now I, I don't remember exactly. But, uh, and even the, the, you know, the Mufti of Kazakhstan was present at the opening of this, uh, <laughs> at the launch of the launch of this movement. But uh, and we also uh, had the kind of reports of uh, Islamist groups inside the security security services. So something was brewing there, and it's not, you know, kind of, it's not. It's not news, you know, to uh, <laughs> to people who are kind of were observing uh, observing Kazakh uh, political scene. Um, so the some say, okay, if it was a coup, why it was so kind of dysfunctional and uh, um, and you know, kind of aren't they kind of smarter people to do things in a smart way? I, I'm not sure they are smart people, you know. Um, actually. I don't think they're particularly smart people um, in the family. Um, and uh, uh, Nazarbayev is a talented guy, obviously. You know, he's, uh, you know, he was an extremely uh, bright politician, but then, you know, sort of went down. Thank you, Nargis. Do we have, do, would Timur, Timur or Pauline uh, comment also on these questions? Sure, I'll just say a couple of things quickly. Um, I, I, I think uh, Nargis uh, alluded to this in her earlier remarks. Um, the best case scenario for Takayev is to get the Nazarbayev family out. Um, when I said the second exit was complete, I meant complete from him himself. Um, his family, of course, I think there are some lingering, uh, obviously some lingering aspects there, but um, I think Takayev is going to do everything he can um, and use whatever uh, legitimacy he can rebuild with the uh, the elite to um, to literally cleanse the country of Nazarbayev's informal influence. He's already formally uh, done much of that. Um, in terms of Islamists, I, I, I also I agree with um, uh, Nargis has said earlier about it being a very convenient label um, to use uh, Islamist terrorists um, both to to activate the CSTO very quickly. Uh, but I think also to some degree, I don't know if this was this was anticipated. I actually don't think Takayev is as strategic and smart as some seem to think he is. Um, I think he was very reactive. I think he panicked in the situation. It was very reactive and didn't think things through, but that might be a, another uh, uh, theme for a, a, a presentation. So I won't go into that too much, but I think that you know he uses these labels conveniently um, to also uh, legitimize himself um, internationally with you know sort of why this is happening. And then domestically, I think if he can convince people that it really was um, these foreign terrorists who hijacked the, these peaceful protesters that they're to blame and not, and not him, so. Can I add one thing, like 30 seconds? Yeah. Of course. Uh, I, I think, yeah, actually it was already mentioned that, that the, uh, the the family and, you know, kind of the, the, the clan, they con control a, a lot of assets, uh, a lot of assets in the country. Uh, and I think it will be kind of, we'll understand a lot when we see <laughs> what, what's going to happen to these assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, gr great points. We we now have like ten minutes left, and I would like to go back on the the protesters themselves, um, and because they are the core, maybe one of the, the the core issue, and something that will not disappear like that because they are coming with with claims, and these claims will need to be addressed in one way or another, or there will be a new wave of. Uh, uh, um, street protests. So we have several questions about the structural reason for protest, how potentially the more kind of social economic issue that we have seen in the Western region could 
cooperate with the maybe more political aspect that we have seen in other cities. We remember the 2019 protests at the moment of the, the, the change of president that were kind of brought by a more kind of urban middle classes, more about political liberalization. And so how do you see the, the, the future of this kind of both the social economic and the political protests can emerge in one kind of bigger movement? Should we talk about movement or about just very different groups and claims that are not coordinated? Do we see any coordination arriving kind of something that would look like a movement or we should continue to speak about several different issues or grievance that are uh, happening in different cities without necessarily the, the coordination. And of course, there was also a question about do we see any figures emerging in terms of uh, uh, leading this kind of more grassroots movement. So it's a lot for the last 10 minutes we have, but I would like to give you the floor for this really, I think, key question. And we will have another session specifically on the protests and this question because it's really a very important one, but we can begin uh, uh, discussing that right now. Who would like well, to I begin? Think, I think, I think, I, I, I'll start. Um, I think here we have to again um, um, recollect uh, Ukraine, uh, compare Ukraine and Belarus. In Belarus, we know that there was no leaders. There were no leaders. Even Svetlana Tikhanovska, who uh, de facto won the, 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 the election, she said openly, publicly, several times in the beginning, I don't want to be a president. The only thing I want is to, to hold a new presidential election. There, were no, there was no coordinated center. That's why, most likely, uh, that's why the, uh, the revolution failed. In Ukraine, all the uh, opposition groups, they forgot about the differences. They uh, were together and they did something which uh, still there and the reforms are underway and uh, they get, got rid of the uh, corrupt uh, President Yanukovych and stuff and we know all the developments here in Kazakhstan it's like more uh, like in Belarus there is no one coordinating uh, or center here we have uh, Mukhtar Ablazov who is not very popular for, in, in many parts of Kazakhstan there are some there are some uh, people who follow him but uh, he was discredited by uh, Kazakh propaganda he also is a person who promised not to be involved in politics. Uh, you know, uh, he was sentenced to five years in prison in 2002. And then in two months after he was uh, forgiven by Nazarbayev and promised to be not to go into politics. And you know, for ordinary Kazakh, yeah, you gave a word and now you're just doing something. This is, this is very specific. Uh, opposition, well, they, there's no, <laughs> there is no one consolidate. There are human rights groups there. There are uh, independent journalists there who try to do something. They are uh, civil civil uh, rights activists, but there is no one coordinating point of a strong opposition. And uh, that's why uh, if there are some kind of protests in future, there might be something which appear now, I don't know, but at this point as we speak now, I don't see that uh, if any kind of protests erupt again in Kazakhstan, something uh, like what happened last week might happen again in the nearest future. Thank you, Mehat. Um, Pauline Nargis, yes, Nargis. Oh, I, I, would, I would second that. It's very localized at the moment, I think, and demands are localized, except for the kind of, we want, you know, uh, the government should go and, you know, the, the, the slogan, Shalket, was kind of <laughs> across the country. Um, and the and on the one hand, that's kind of it's easier to to suppress these things, but at the same time, we, when it gets big, you know, the way we saw last last week, yeah, whom do they talk to? Whom do they negotiate with? You know, mm. uh, so there is no kind of there are no channels, and I think they are so kind of. You hear that from some, you know, top-level people and some deputies uh, that okay, we, we we do need to create something. We do need some some political reforms and you know, kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, um, create the channels for for communication. So, but but we'll see it. The, mm -hmm. It it will take time because it was so purged. 
you know, <laughs> the the field that, that it will take time for grass to for grass and flowers to grow. Uh, but I think now things are happening so fast that I will not be surprised if within the year we'll have a different situation. Thank you, Timo. Would you like to add something? Yeah, I would. Uh, I want just to conclude by saying that um, uh, Kazakhstan uh, will, uh, you know, continue to be a um, object of our interest for the nearest future. Uh, but for now, uh, for for us uh, now, it's uh, very very important to. Uh, filter the information that we get from uh, Kazakhstan and to make sure that we don't, um, um, you know, um, believe in different narratives uh, that are spread uh, right now across um, Kazakhstan by different sources. There are so, so many theories um, about what is going on and what will happen uh, that um, I think uh, we should be very, very, um, you know, um, accurate in uh, picking this information. Yeah, that's a great point, Timo. Thank you. Uh, Pauline, would you like to add something and conclude? Oh, thank you. Yes, I just want to say that I, I think we shouldn't have been so surprised by what happened over the past week. Um, if we were sort of paying attention, uh, like I said, since roughly, 2015, 2014, there, there have been an increasing uh, number of protests and the protests have uh, scaled up and they've spread. I think Kazakh activists, you're right, they don't have a, a leadership, um, they don't have a real organization, but in, in face of obstacles, great obstacles to a vibrant civil society, um, they have been learning and they have been, um, you know, um, building and I think they'll, they'll continue to build. They'll, they'll, if Tukayev does not take on serious, real serious political and economic reform, and I'm I'm more doubtful than Nargis is in, in this. I think he's had lots of opportunities to do this, and we haven't seen him um, take on this reform. But if he if he fails to do that, we will see uh, future uprisings, and particularly around election time. Um, so that's why I'm looking at 2023, where local elections are supposed to be held, and 2024, the presidential elections, to see what happens. Great, well, I think on that we will be able to conclude. It has been really wonderful and I wanted to thank you all of you for, for giving us your, your comments and all of you trying to stay very uh, uh, modest in what we know and as Timo was saying, how we have to filter information and also be careful about the lenses we are using to interpret what is happening. So thank you everybody. Thank you all of the 500 people we had with us today for the very lively, discussion, uh, uh, a lot of yeah, uh, warm feelings and to all those of you who have uh, uh, close families and friends and colleagues in, in, in Kazakhstan. And we will be reconvening probably in a few days early next week for other uh, events, hopefully with our Kazakh friends based in Kazakhstan once internet will be able to be totally restored. So once again, thank you uh, uh, to all of you and hope to be uh, continuing our discussion very soon. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Thank you.